Hi, this is Arlo Gilbert. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Osano. And today I'm the host of the Privacy Insider Podcast. I am so excited to welcome this next guest, Max Schrems of NOYB.eu. If you're not familiar with Max, he is the reason that the Privacy Shield was taken down as a legitimate transfer mechanism. He has gone up against some of the biggest companies in the world. It's a true David and Goliath story. And if you go and listen to this conversation, what you're going to find is that Max is doing this because he believes that privacy is a fundamental human right and that doing the right thing is good for business and consumers. All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Privacy Insider podcast. My name is Arlo Gilbert. I am the CEO and co-founder of Osano. And today we are thrilled to be able to welcome a guest that you've probably all heard of. His name is Max Schrems. He is the man, the myth, the legend who originally filed the first big lawsuit against Facebook, which ended up causing Privacy Shield to be withdrawn as a mechanism by which United States and EEA residents could exchange data. Um, and that changed the world a lot. So Max, welcome to the show. We are so happy to have you. Thanks a lot for the invite. I'm not sure if we changed the world or probably the privacy bubble we changed. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Max, um, regardless, we've got a fantastic uh, set, of, uh, set of dialogues that we've been talking through, and I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about Max as a person. Uh, I know that one of the themes we have on the show here is that privacy can sometimes be kind of lonely, uh, especially if you're a trust officer or a director of privacy. And so we'd love to try and dive a little bit into the who is behind uh, all of this exciting stuff that's happening in the world of privacy. Maybe we can just start out with a, a really quick introduction. So for those who don't know you, which I, I can't quite imagine many folks listening won't have heard of you, uh, you know, maybe you can tell us just a little bit about NOYB uh, and kind of what the organization is, what it does, assuming that folks don't know. Yeah, so um, NOIB is basically, used to be an acronym for none of your business, but we usually tried not to use that. Um, and um, we're a nonprofit organization. We're based in Vienna, theoretically, and, and also in reality, but um, we're basically working on a European level. So we don't really bring any cases specifically in Austria or so. Um, and we are right now 25 people, um, three, four programmers, developers, and, and, and we also do a lot of our actual processing in-house, which is, I know by now not usual, but as a privacy nonprofit, you kind of want to have control over your servers and so on. Um, then we do have around, um, 11 lawyers right now, as far as I'm, because we're having people joining. So, um, that's that also from all over Europe. Um, usually a lot of them have actually worked as compliance officers before, as, as DPOs before and so on. Um, and then a little bit of PR and so on. And we usually also have a couple of trainees that um, do what maybe some people know is the GDPR hub. So we basically have this wiki or interactive page where we summarize usually around 20 decisions in Europe per, per week and send that out via an email. It's for free and anybody can subscribe to it. Um, and that's quite nice because um, without really advertising it, we now have more than 10,000 subscribers, which most of them are, are DPOs and so on. And they, for example, filter all of that and translate all these national decisions because as always in Europe, we have kind of the language barrier of not even being able to you know, find out what the French have actually decided or the Spanish. Um, so with that central database, um, we, we can do that. That's a big part of the, what the trainees, for example, do. Um, but otherwise we have more than 800 cases that are right now pending all over the place. Um, and you can actually on our website go into the projects we do and look at each individual case, uh, what we do when we filed it, each step of the way is usually in, in, in the public there. Um, so we're quite open of what we do. But people always, you know, see the, the data transfers as the one thing or the other thing that they think we do. But we are actually quite broad in, in, in the stuff that we do. That's fascinating. And so you've got 800 cases. Um I think a lot of folks would be really interested in understanding two things. Um, one, how do you guys afford to do that? That seems like it would take a lot of money. Uh, and then I think the second piece that that I would certainly love to understand is how are you going about selecting cases? Because I'm imagining there are more than you could ever pursue. Tell us about NYOB's, uh, NOYB's funding 
Uh, and, and then also maybe a little bit how you select cases. And, and I will also say before anybody gets started, um, your website is N O Y B dot E U. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so go there, fill out the form to get the <laughs> newsletter. It's a fantastic site. I love it. We mainly get our money from individual, um, members of the organization. So you become, can become a supporting member for like one Euro or up to, yeah, whatever you want. Um, and that is the bulk of our income actually. So we're rather independent. We're not like, you know, um, a lot of organizations are funded by one or big, I don't know, foundations, for example. And then you're kind of dependent on that foundation. So we're kind of largely on that side. There's a little bit of money from foundations. There is individual donations where people just randomly send stuff to our bank account. Um, and we also get some money, for example, by the Austrian government. So the um, consumer rights ministry, for example, or the city of Vienna, where we're based, um, they also add something. So that all together adds up to, to a certain amount. There is a little bit of sponsoring as well by companies, not much because obviously we have a kind of strict sponsoring policy. Um, and that is where basically money comes from. Um, and for selecting cases, I think that maybe the more interesting part is we kind of have three buckets of cases. Uh, the first type we usually call kind of um, standard setting cases where we say, okay, there is this legal question of, I don't know, how far can you scrape data for AI, let's say, you know, um, what, what what are you allowed to do there or not? And there's different views and um, largely also from a um, company side, it's just we need some clarity in these questions. And, and that is where these um, standard setting cases come from to say, okay, there's two or three different views we need to get to the European Data Protection Board or to the Court of Justice to just give us an answer if that's legal or not. Um, and that is that is that. And we usually invest much more time in these cases, much more than a normal law firm would, would be able to invest. Um, and also then get external researchers, universities involved, you know, people that know more about uh, the facts than we do necessarily or that also did research on these questions. Um, that's, that's a big um, project usually. Um, then the second part that we do is kind of um, pure enforcement cases. So the typical um, your cookie banner doesn't even have a reject button kind of situation where we standardize cases extremely. And there's basically text blocks and systems that automatically detect stuff and, and, and try to enforce it, um, including that we usually inform the companies up front and say, you know, guys, you are violating this and that. Here's the complaint that we would file in two months unless you want to settle right away and just get, get over with it. And um, that's usually more, let's say, served on the silver plate on this is how you can comply if you want to, here is an invite. Um, if you don't want to, we would still go to the authorities, but um, that usually um, in our cases work quite well that more than 50% of the companies just settle right away because it's oftentimes in, in the dynamic that we see that the DPO is even going to their CEO and says, you know, I almost always told you we're not allowed to do this. Now there's a complaint that suddenly, you know, the internal compliance people are suddenly heard that weren't heard for a long time. So we actually got the feedback that for a lot of the DPOs getting a complaint was actually quite useful for their internal standing within the company. That is fascinating. I mean, that you know, things you wouldn't have thought would happen as a result. And, and you guys, I mean, I, th I think a lot of people on the outside of your work, myself included, the way the media ends up often portraying NOIB and, and yourself are that you're kind of a, a vigilante that's out for justice and you're going after Facebook. But, you know, it sounds to me like this is a, more about just rule of law. It, 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 would that be accurate? It's not personal? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we usually try to kind of filter cases um, depending on how many people are in, uh, impacted, how much is it a clear breach of the law? How much is it maybe an edge case that we also want to pursue because we want to know what, you know, where where the edge case lands on which side of, uh, of the decision. Um, and so we usually are, are in the internal process and in that maybe also like the legal education that at least I had in Austria is very academic. It's very, um, you know, you take your personal views aside and then you just look at the letter of the law and you try to be let's say, um, more of a natural sciences approach to, to law than, than, um, than maybe in the common law system. And that also informs kind of the decision making within that we basically say, okay, what is your evidence? How, you know, I'm usually the biggest devil's advocate within the organization to kind of you know, ask people all the evil questions that they don't want to be um, asked. Um, but that usually also in, in, increases the quality of what we do a lot. Oftentimes, to be honest, if we see the answers from even some big law firms, I think we're usually taking a more 
neutral professional approach to things than a lot of people that you know work on the other side. I I would at least claim that, um, and that's part, for example, of having this GDPR hub thing, for example, that I mentioned before. It's really about just saying, okay, this is what the courts decide on this matter. Here are the ten decisions. Here you can actually research and find out what the answer is to this question. Um, and that is that is kind of the approach we're taking in, in most of that. And that usually is, I, I would say, also the reason why our success rate is quite high is, is we hardly lose cases because we usually know what we're doing here. Um, the ones that are lost are largely because we just settle because we're like, okay, you've did it anyways, let's just pull back the complaint or something like that. Um, or in many countries, there is options that if the, uh, if the company kind of settles within the procedure that they close the case and, and then it's not a one case, but that is more, um, statistically also the reason why I think what we do works well. And that also builds a reputation that, you know, if someone tells you, you're going to get a complaint from that organization, usually it's taken seriously enough that people are like, okay, this is something we're probably not going to get rid of that quickly because these guys, you know, know what they're doing. Yes. Yes. You guys definitely have, have, have the expertise that the world. (laughs) Exactly. And that, I mean, that's kind of, let's say also when it comes to funding and, you know, being obviously always the smaller underdog is once you have the quality, I usually tell people that, you know, it's a bit this, if you look at this David versus Goliath thing, you just have to be that David that kind of knows where is the point where it hurts, where is the right angle of attack and so on. And then usually, even if you're, let's say, the small organization, it, it, it leads to an end. Again, we had I had a lot of discussions when I brought this Schrems 1, so to say, case back then, that a lot of my U.S. friends were like, you're never going to win this. Like, you know, they have a big law firm. They're going to, you know, do X, Y, Z. And I think we have some of that dynamic in Europe as well, but not as much. So you can't just, you know, swamp people all too much by just having the deeper pockets. Um, So there is still some room where you can actually um, get stuff enforced, even if you're a smaller guy. And that is, that is quite useful for us usually, obviously. Got it. Got it. And I mean, I think that one of the things that you're, you're saying, if I'm hearing it right, is that this is, this is not about trying to litigate for dollars, right? This is not the American justice system where you're trying to go get rich. No, if that, if that was what we were doing, we would do everything wrong. <laughs> like, yeah. And so your motivation then, I mean, the, the motivation for, for NOIB and for yourself for going out and doing these things uh, and, and, you know, sending these, you know, filing these cases, giving them opportunity to settle. It sounds like the intention is really just to do the right thing, not necessarily to end up in court. Sometimes the right thing is ending up in court. So that's, that's not, um, let's say that doesn't, doesn't um, the one thing does not say that you don't do the other. Um, it depends on what your aim is. I mean, if we talk about the kind of um, standard setting cases, then the aim is to get a higher court to kind of really say what, what the rule is um, and what the law of the land is. And that is something where you usually don't settle. You want to have the courts to give an answer to, to the question because you're actually out for the bigger issue. Like if we just know that the court of justice tells us, I don't know, if you do an access request, you actually have to list each named recipient and not just say, oh, we send it to partners. Once we know that from the court of justice, thousands of discussions in are done because we just know that. Um, so um, in these cases, obviously, you don't want to settle. You want to get this, this decision after all. Um, and that's different than the mere enforcement cases where obviously you just want to get stuff done and want to kind of end the violations. And then it's more of a settlement thing. So it depends on what you do um, and what the strategy is behind the case. Are there any of these standard setting cases? Um, you know, you think about, you know, there's a law, the law isn't necessarily clear or there's room for interpretation. The courts need to hear it and, and, and come up with their interpretation. Have there been any of these standard setting cases that you've been surprised by the outcome? Generally not. I think the Court of Justice um, is luckily a bit detached from the privacy bubble. They just look at the law and are like, okay, guys, how else would you have thought this is interpreted? Because that's how we interpret any other law as well. So they're usually also being based in Luxembourg. They're also geographically detached from some of the Brussels lobbying bubble and so on. And I mean, that's intentional. That's the reason why the court is not in Brussels. Um, and so usually the responses are actually quite okay. Like, I don't think that there are too, you know, pro privacy or too anti. It's kind of like, if you look at the law and you kind of try to be reasonable, you usually end at these results. There are some outlier cases, I guess, in different directions where like, okay, that's a bit odd. 
Uh, we had some, you know, there's usually in Europe the advocate general before the court itself decides. There's this kind of advocate general at the court of justice doing like an, an, a non-binding opinion. Some of them were like really strange, like some of them had, had like really weird parts in it. Um, but usually the Court of Justice, I felt, is quite predictable in a sense. And um, we have some litigation there. So last time we were in Luxembourg, we also um, basically did a tour and talked to some of the people off the court. Um, and they also informed us that like they tried to cluster certain things. So they tried to give the same matter within the price. Like there's tons of GDPR cases at the Court of Justice, much more than any other EU law, because no local judge wants to deal with it. So they just send it off to Luxembourg. Um, and that's an issue because they just have a load of them. But for example, for all the emotional damages cases, and I think by now there are 15 or something at the Court of Justice, all of them go to the same judge. So we will have a rather consistent repetition of, of the previous rulings. And obviously every law firm on the other side tries to find some difference in one of these judgments, um, but um, they, they are aware of that and they usually try to be consistent in what they say. And so far, it's quite OK. I mean, there are some things that I would have probably decided a little bit differently here and there. But overall, they're quite OK. Um, the one thing that we actually were surprised about was there is one judgment about this whole pay or case situation where they indicate that you could actually pay instead of consenting and that that is the reject that you basically put a price tag on the reject button. And that is an interesting case because in that case, that was never discussed. So it must have later in the drafting of the judgment, some judge must have like filled in these six words. Um, and now you see how the whole legal industry tries to jump on these words. Um, we actually had a court hearing um, against Facebook actually um, in January. So after that first judgment and the judges were not that clear on it. They were like, OK, what does that mean in practice? Is that really freely given and so on? And I mean, the answer is probably not because we know that 99.9% that's not like that's the real number. 99.9% .9 agree in the paid or case situation when we actually know just I don't know, three or 10 percent actually depends on the study, actually one half advertising, for example. So it's kind of a North Korean result. And that North Korean result is probably not freely given. But um, that was never discussed at the Court of Justice so far. So there are some of these cases where, yeah, there is like, you know, these two or three words and a very, very long judgment that may not be that smart or not that well thought of. And, and, and we learned that, that obviously law firms are paid to kind of ignore the other 100 50 paragraphs and just look at that one paragraph and try to isolate that. Um, so there are some of these situations where, let's say, there could have been more thinking if, if that is a necessary sentence. <laughs> On the topic of pay, pay to access, right, that's a really interesting one. We hear that from our customers asking us, hey, is, is it permissible, right? Um, can we do those things? Um, I mean, so the, the court has said it's okay. Uh, and I guess the take was that it's like, it's, it's relative to the value. You know, I can't charge you a million dollars. That's absolutely not there. So that's a really interesting thing. It says, um, it has to be, um, appropriate and so on, but you also have to see that the whole paragraphs before and after talk about that. It has to be a genuine choice of the person and really freely given and blah, 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 blah. So if you look in, 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 in context, I think what's really interesting how to answer a lot of that is that statistics, like we can, I mean, a lot of like, what is a free choice? You can discuss that a hundred times and we could probably discuss that for hours. Um, but we do know, for example, what objectively people want. Like, do they objectively want to have chocolate or strawberry? You know, <laughs> we know we can, we can ask for that. And if we know 3% want to have chocolate, but 99% get chocolate stuffed in their mouth, then we do know that there is some discrepancy here um, that is indicating that there is no free choice of people. And that is more where, how we are approaching that. And that also includes, for example, um, deceptive design, or as, as the industry calls it, um, consent optimization. And if we have situations where we know we're basically we objectively know if we have a neutral yes or no question that people kind of say, I don't know, saying something, 20% hit the one button. And suddenly I, you know, hide everything, do all the tricks in, in the books, um, and I get a 99% rate. Then I know that this was probably not really what people want. And then the whole element of fairness in the GDPR or an, and of freely given is that you should actually have a genuine exchange on, on what people want. And and I think what, what for me is really interesting is I think what is useful for companies is to think more about what does my customer actually want? Like, how can I make the journey as you know easy for people as possible? How not to have more friction and how not to get, let's say, 
in a fight with a customer. And that depends on, on your business model, obviously. But, you know, if you're selling shoes or whatever, you usually you want people to like your page and to get on and buy their shoes, you know? Um, so for us, for example, we decided we don't have any cookies. We basically, if we have any statistics, we get that from the server, for example. Um, and we have that in an anonymized way. So we simply do not have a consent banner. And it was interesting because people get so used to a consent banner, for example, that we got complaint emails that we do not have a consent banner. It's like, yes, because we're not doing anything with your data. So we don't need that banner. We don't need your consent. <laughs> You know, these dynamics are quite interesting. And I think, I mean, if there are ways to kind of go forward and think about that as a positive to kind of say, OK, we have this option. This makes, you know, something more personal or cooler or nicer on our website and you can activate it or not. And, you know, if it's really a tool that you want, you, you will push the button. And if not, just not. Um, and I think that is more of a an ethos or an approach that in the long run would probably build more stable customer relationships in my perfect world. Um, but obviously it's very different if you're a newspaper that basically puts out all the news out for free, they want to have that news anyways, and they will go through any roadblocks to get to this news. Um, so the, these situations are obviously a bit different there. I, I love that though. I mean, I think it, it all comes down to, I mean, here at our business, we talk about, you know, we try to simplify things because it's pretty easy to get caught up in the morass of the law. But ultimately, this is kind of the golden rule, right? Do, treat people the way that you would want to be treated. And, and you know, these are the, the kind of the things we teach our children, but we don't necessarily do a very good job of teaching the leaders of businesses. The way I look at consent is fundamentally, at least for the European bubble, it's a fundamental right. So you have a right to your data as a fundamental right, like your freedom of speech or your right to bodily integrity, or I don't know, all the, the list of like, I think more than 40 fundamental rights we have. Um, like in privacy, there are all these limitations under Article 6B to F, where you know someone else can actually interfere with your fundamental right for good reasons that we accept in the law. If there is nothing left, then I basically have to ask the other person to give up their rights. And that's what consent is to basically say, you know, if you're in a free and liberal society, you can jump off a bridge and thereby give up your right to life. So as a person, you can also give up your right to privacy. But after all, it's so to say a giving up of a right or a gift from that person that that right now pushes the button. There's oftentimes this mentality or this thinking of, oh, I have a right to all of this. And just because of some law, I need them to kind of go through some stupid compliance stuff. The transaction that really happens in the background is that someone says, okay, I'm fine with you spying on me for some whatever reason, or, you know, on, on, or, you know, profiling me to get uh, better products or whatever it is, um, maybe legitimate, maybe cool, maybe not. And for everybody, the answer is different, but that's the transaction that we have here. And, um, and we would hardly accept anywhere else that, you know, if you give up your right to vote or your right to, freedom of speech or your right to bodily integrity or whatever, that you're basically going through 25 different buttons and you're forced to do it. Um, and they're all dark patterns so that you're accidentally going to make the wrong choice. Exactly. exactly. Um, so um, I think that is a bit uh, of a mindset question as well, because we moved from a situation where that data was just taken anyways towards, oh, okay, there's the GDPR. We now have to do something, but actually the default is still, we take the data anyways. And now we just have to, you know, wrap that somehow that it's legal towards a mentality of actually, I don't have a right to it, at least when it comes to advertisement and so on. And, but I can ask people and then it's more of a question of also showing to people what the benefit is. Like, what is the upside? Do I get a discount or do I get something that, that is that actually for me as a person giving up these rights has any benefit? How do you reconcile, Max? I'm, I'm really curious because, you know, we're, we're talking about cookie banners and that is something that we do here. And so I'm, I'm delighted to talk about it, but I mean, how do you reconcile? I, I read a lot of people saying, I hate cookie banners. These things are horrible. They get in the way of me reading my article. They get in the way of me finding out what happened in the news. Is the future a world where um, cookies have gone away and, and the default is non-tracking, no spying, no data transfer, and you know it moves into a different direction? Or do you think that we stay in this current era of, you know, everybody just has a cookie banner and you have to be informed and read it. I think what, what's, what's missing in the conversation usually is all the 20 options in between. Mainly we talk to newspapers, obviously, in Europe, because that's like where, you know, we all know they have funding issues and so on. And, and, and there, is, there is a lot of reasons to uh, make sure that they can still 
um, run a business. And they actually tell you that largely they run a free, freemium model by now, that they have their like behind paywall anyways content and having the free stuff is basically just to get traffic to later have the people, for example, to, to pay for it. That is one business model. Um, others are, you know, we have sponsored content and that is where we actually make the money from. So this idea of advertisement is the only way to make money online is, is a bit too simplistic, so to say. Um, and there will be more room, I guess, for all these other options, like be it contextual. Best example is all these um, influencers that now pop up all over the place. They do contextual advertisement. They're like, I'm the pretty girl. Here is the, you know, the eyelash thingy that I use. <laughs> this is contextual advertisement. It's as contextual as can be. And they make a shitload of money with that. So, um, and, and I think this, this narrative of only data-driven advertisement can actually work, only this and that can work, is a bit too simplistic. And it may be that, for example, this contextual, because people just trust that influencer, may work much better than any kind of advertisement that spies on people. Now, um, to also, um, I think, from a European context, the two things that I think would be interesting is, first of all, to codify a do not track signal so that this exchange can actually happen in the background and it's much like, like less invasive so that basically your browser sends out usually header signal or something to the software on the on the on the um, server side that then obviously manages that so you basically have the same software exchange just that you don't have the banner visible anymore it just happens in the background and um, that's actually foreseen in the GDPR. The problem is that there is no mechanism to set the standard right now. So like the GDPR says there has to be a technical option to opt out, but there is no standard setting. So if we send a signal saying, I don't, I want to, like, there is no right that they accept exactly that signal. So that's a problem on that side. The second part that I think um, where, to be honest, the e-privacy directive probably goes a bit too far is any cookie that is set always consent, does that always need consent? So for example, a big discussion that's ongoing is, can we say that if you have, um, if you have analytics that go towards um, anonymized data, so that basically you say, okay, I do have a cookie for the 10 minutes you're on the website, but basically it gets anonymized right away. And we actually do not keep personal data from that, but we do need that for statistics, which is a large part for like the non-advertisement bubble of why they have cookies. Like in the, the, the average small website has a cookie for statistical purposes largely. Yeah, I want to understand which web pages people visit the most. You know, which article is exciting to them. And if you have like a let's say solid law around that that says okay, that is how anonymization has to be done. That is how quickly it has to be done, and so on. That could be something that we could also allow by default, just like the you know, the, the um, I don't know, web shop cookie that you don't need consent for. Um, so I think there's some wiggle room to say, do we really need consent for all the things that are there to narrow it down to like the actual problematic situations um, and not have a consent banner on each K website that just, I don't know, does, you know, how many people chose the language or something. Um, so I think there is some room from a European perspective to be, a, to be have the consent transaction easier and on the other hand, limited to where it's really like a problem and where there's interference with privacy, really. And I think that could be a way forward. What's interesting is going to be with the new European Commission. They obviously know that e-privacy is still not done, um, where all of that is in. And there is talks that they now split it because a big part why this, these reforms never happened was they're in the same law that do data retention for government surveillance purposes. And, you know, then the French wanted that and they blocked that. So this law, they ideally, they could split it up into four or five laws where they could discuss each one of these things separately and not block it all over the place. So that is where, where we hope that some of the consent issue or cookie banner issue will go away. Um, and the other thing is once you have fair but banners like um, where you really have a yes or no option, then, you know, fair enough, you may ask people if they, you know, donate money to you. That's what we as an NGO do, like give away their right to property um, by a donation and you can have a yes or no button. Once the interaction is fair and transparent and easy for people to understand, then I guess then also the, the drama of it will be less because if it's really, you know, not a click marathon, but a quick uh, interaction and you're done, that's also useful also from a conversation, like how much websites actually then have traffic and, and so on. Because like, I mean, an annoying banner is for me, for example, one of the things why I close a website. Like if you confront me with such a shitty interface or in such an annoying way of interacting with me as a customer, as the first thing I see from your website, I'd rather buy my shit somewhere else. Um, so I think that is also parts of, of um, on an economic side where I'm not the expert, obviously. 
but that must be thought about as well, not just like, you know, what is the click rate we get of the people that actually goes through. Yeah. It's a, it's a really interesting conundrum. Um, you, you raise newspapers as a great example, right? Newspapers are in a unique position because, you know, we rely upon local media for the vast majority of information about what's happening in our community, what's happening in the law, what's happening in the world. Um, and so there is definitely some very critical public good that is necessary for us to have small media organizations that survive. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I worry a little bit about the viability of smaller media organizations in the face of these privacy challenges, right? They found a model that, 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 that made them money, but it wasn't necessarily an exchange that was fair or well, where, well disclosed or consented to. I don't know where they're going to go, but I, I, that's one of the things that keeps me up at night is what happens to local media. Yeah, I mean, I think in the European context, it's a bit different because we usually have public media on top of it that is funded by like TV taxes and so on. So, for example, in Austria, the most visited website is actually the public broadcaster's website, the news page, like BBC or something and just the Austrian version. Um, so that that changes a bit that dynamic. But um, we definitely have that problem. But if you really ask um, media companies how their business model works right now, the big problem is that just the advertisement dollar has gone away to Google and Facebook and so on. So it's not necessarily just a privacy problem and, and giving up that data. Um, we all know these statistics of how much more money you can actually make with like personalized ads versus other ads. Um, and especially in markets that may be a bit smaller, um, they usually tell us that they make more money with dumb ads that they directly sell to a company <laughs> um, because all the revenue goes into the pocket of the news media. Um, then with Google ads. So they usually in Europe, at least they tell you that we actually do our own inventory first. And then for the empty space where, you know, better than making zero, we get 0 0.0001 if we do, do the Google ads. So I think there is also a, a little bit more um, discussion that we must have. But obviously, the big question is really how do we finance um, quality media and who defines what quality media is? Um, and, and that's really a big one. And I think um, I was recently in the German uh, Bundestag, like the German parliament, where this discussion also came up. To basically just say by just giving away the data of the of the users, we can save the media, is just not an answer. Like that probably is like little drops on a big problem, and it's not going to turn around the problem. So I'm a bit worried that oftentimes the privacy debate gets thrown underneath a, a bus of a bigger media and and access to information debate that is so much bigger, that is so much financially, so much um, so much uh, of a bigger problem that we're not going to save that with a couple of like cookies that, that they can use for free. Um, I understand the dynamic and so on and that it's a problem, but this is not going to save it. This is not going to solve the problem. Um, and, and for how to save it, to be honest, there are people that do media law and, and financing of media and are experts in that. And I think that's the guys that we probably need there. That is a, uh, a very good point. So, you know, we talked about the commercial side of things. Um, uh, you know, so we've got things like media organizations. We've talked about your time, uh, uh, you know, litigating at Facebook a little bit. I wonder when we think about the GDPR and we think about, you know, where its origins came from, right? We, we've, we've talked about, uh, I've, I've certainly talked about it in, in previous podcasts, you know, Castle Doctrine and things like that, right? A lot of this was driven by a fear of governments misusing data. At NOIB, um, you know, we hear mostly about the litigation against commercial entities, right? The Googles, the Facebooks. Do you ever tackle governments? Do, does government use of data concern you? Like, how do you think about that? Um, concern, yes. Um, as an organization, we're not doing it for a very simple reason. Um, and that's very technical at the same time. Um, we do have the GDPR across country. So basically, in the private sector, we have one unified law across Europe. And um, for, let's say, strategic litigation, there's a lot of room. To give you a simple example, if we have an appeal in Ireland against the Data Protection Authority, it costs 100,000 and upwards. Um, if we do an appeal in Austria, it's 30 euros and upwards. So bringing a case in Austria actually has some sense to it uh, because the legal systems are even more different than in the US. Really choosing your bell and where you want to go gives you much more benefit than, than in, in the US setting. And even in the US, there's a lot of like, you know, forum shopping, as, as they call it. Um, so that's part of why we see benefits on a European level of enforcement in a private sector. 
Now, if you go to the government sector, usually each country has its own system of a constitutional court and, and appeals for challenging usually surveillance laws, where typically it's a constitutional issue and typically it's not governed by EU law. Um, so the GDPR exempts any kind of law enforcement. Um, there is a law enforcement directive next to it, but gives much more wiggle room to the member state. Now, for any of these lit- types of litigation, I do not think that sitting here in Vienna, we're going to be smarter than some local nonprofit organization that does government surveillance for 20 years and actually knows what they're doing and how their law works. Um, so we actually try to stay out of that. Um, we do support people. We do. Um, sometimes there's also overlaps where the government is actually tapping into um into business records and even the business is not very happy about that so sometimes there is an overlap where we can say you know from a gpr perspective you're not allowed to give that data out because that law is so wacky and not compliant that as a business you're not allowed to do that so there is some you know interaction sometimes or data transfers is the best example where after all it's about government surveillance on the u.s side but the litigation is the b2b data transfers between a european business and an american business so there is that but um it's not a, let's say, hard no, but it is that the typical surveillance laws that go too far are done by other organizations. And um, we are, however, in the same network. It's called EDRI, European Digital Rights Initiative, where I think more than 40 organizations are organized in. Um, and most of the others do the government surveillance part. So there was also not that much need to actually have another organization doing that. Got it. So that's great to know. I learned something new today. I had not heard of that organization. It, can you just say it again? What was the name? Um, it's EDRI, um, and that's basically the umbrella organizations of, of all the digital rights organizations in, in Europe, European Digital Rights Initiative. That's fantastic. I had no idea that existed. Wow. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about you know courts and your approach to selecting cases and all that kind of stuff. I'd love to know a little bit about you. Um, you know, when we think about, you know, what gets Max up in the morning, um, I know that when we talk to privacy pros, everybody has a non-linear path to ending up where they ended up, right? And it sounds like you did too. I, I would love to hear a little bit about, like, when did you first say, oh, privacy is interesting? Uh, this is a category I, I find interesting because because we all know that you went and and I think now, correct me. You were a, you were still a law student when you filed the first case. I mean, what was the inspiration? Like, I, why did you care? First of all, it's a hugely cultural thing. Like, what is private and not is different in different cultures. And I was an exchange student in Florida when I was like sixteen, going to high school there. And one of the first things that, like, as a European, was super interesting is you got an ID number. All your grades were in percentages, and you were like, you know, they oftentimes say they make a number out of you, and that really you know, felt like that a bit, that you were just one of these 2,000 people and no one really cared. But then you were in the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Everybody's waiting, voting Republican and goes to the Baptist church on, on, on Sundays. And we still had a police station at the school and like video surveillance all over the place. And also the teachers were kind of under surveillance because within two minutes they had to type into their computer if everybody's here. And, you know, then they were terrified of the front office because the front office is calling in once. So there was this whole mechanism that I didn't know from any school in Austria. And, uh, and you know, you then start asking people, um, you know, how does this and that work? And you hear about credit ranking agencies the first time in your life. This does No one in Austria knows credit ranking exists. Like no one has ever heard of that. In Germany, they know it. In Austria, not. In many EU countries, it doesn't even, is. it's not even a thing. So a lot of this of, oh, I have to build credit to later actually, you know, get a loan or something, just like this just all doesn't exist to a certain extent. So I think at that point that was already, like I was interested in, you know, who knows what about anybody before, but, you know, that was probably the first culture shock, so to say. Um, where that was quite interesting. Um, and then uh, starting in law school, we were still in this kind of decade after 9-11 where each government came up with a new surveillance idea and a new law here and there where they would, were starting to spy on stuff. That was the same thing here. So we usually then had like student you know, discussions on, on this and that latest surveillance law. So you got a bit more interested in that. And I have to say in Austria, the law study is very structured. So you cannot really do subjects that you are interested in. You kind of have to do everything. Um, there's a little bit where you can specialize. And so I did the um, kind of IT law specialization that existed at the time. Um, and the other part maybe is that um, I had programming in high school. So I kind of know how to do, like I can read code. I know how what this machine is doing, which I think for a lot of lawyers is a bit like they still talk about this 
you know, they don't really understand what the facts are. Yes, no, mo most attorneys would not say they're a technical. Yeah, I'm telling you what to do, but I actually don't know how factually all of this works. So um, that's a bit of a benefit as well, that you may have less of a fear of, you know, interacting with technology because you're like, I can talk to an IT person and be like, okay, that's what it does um, and understand what it does. Um, so that may also be a factor. And, um, and then to be honest, it just kind of happened to me. Like in the sense that I was in, I was already doing some privacy cases in Austria before. Then I had half a year off basically in Santa Clara and Silicon Valley where um, I did kind of the hardest exam in the law school in Austria. And then I just wanted to have a break for half a year. Um, so I went there and that was quite nice. Um, and we had like people coming from all different big tech companies. And, and basically the story was like, you know, Europeans are kind of cute with their whole privacy stuff, but if you don't comply, nothing happens anyways. So um, and that's true. I mean, that's still true today, to be honest. So that got me a bit more interested. And I actually got the data from Facebook back then, this kind of like uh, made an access request. And they actually sent me, me and friends, um, CDs with like, I think, I don't know, 1,200 pages, I think was my PDF that they sent to me. One of them actually went to Australia because I think there was the classic Australia-Austria mix-up. So we got a tracking code and it we saw how it first flew to Sydney and then back to Austria. Cross-border transfers. <laughs> and it was interesting because suddenly we had all the data that, um, you know, they should have deleted already and they just served it right to us. Like no one at Facebook really thought probably what they were doing here. And they were still a very young company, probably not anybody really knowing what, what, what they do there. Um, that started off like, okay, we'll just send that to the regulator. They're regulated in Ireland. The, the authority is going to be happy to have all the evidence right on their front door. And we'll probably do something until you realize that regulator is doing absolutely nothing and tries everything to protect the local businesses. <laughs> and then, you know, you step by step say, okay, how about filing a complaint? How about going to the courts and how to escalate that? And it more happened to me and, and I was never, I never wanted to be the first row also. I always felt like I'm better in the second row oftentimes, but especially at the time, everybody wanted to talk about privacy and you needed kind of the story also in the media and that, that, you know, student going against big company, at least in the European context was, was the story that, that they were interested in and, and that suddenly got you, um, being this, I usually say privacy Mickey Mouse like this you know, face for a topic somehow. Um, and then you can't really get rid of it. And I said, you know, I lost, I lost my privacy over privacy cases. So that is ironic. Uh, you know, <laughs> that you became the, the privacy face and now everybody knows you. Yeah. It's like you're at a club late night and people are like, oh, you're the privacy guy. What are you doing? <laughs> so it's not really, uh, not always like the, <laughs> the most interesting part. <laughs> when you were a student, because so my, my understanding from, from our previous discussion was that in Austria, you know, you go to law school and then you have a mandatory period of time after which you're kind of sponsored. How are you able to file a lawsuit as a student? You do not have to be a lawyer to actually file something like um, that's also it depends on each member state, to be honest. Uh, but for example, in Austria, it's rather simple. You can go on any Tuesday that's ever since the King's times. On any Tuesday, you can go to any local court and just orally file a lawsuit. You don't even have to have anything. So it's it depends on the country. It's extremely different per country. Um, but um, when it comes to data protection and complaints, I mean, the whole idea of the complaints with the DPAs is that any normal user should be able to actually file a complaint and, and um, get their rights enforced by the authorities if the GDPR would work as intended. Um, so that's, that wasn't really ever a bigger problem, to be honest. It's more um, if you then go into the courts, into the second layer, that the problems start. Because, um, for example, in, in Austria, as I said, it's about 30 euros to file a complaint. Um, but let's say you have a right to file a complaint with the DPA. The DPA simply doesn't do it. Now, theoretically, the complaint is for free and we're all happy and so on. Um, but if a German DPA simply doesn't process your complaint, you can go to the German courts, but that costs you about 5,000 euros. And because um, it's administrative procedure, you don't get the money back even if you win. So after all, as a normal citizen, you pay 5,000 bucks to get your free complaint, so to say. Um, and so a lot of these dynamics are very different. And we have the problem that most of the big tech companies are based in Ireland for tax avoidance reasons. Um, and Ireland has probably the worst legal system I've ever seen anywhere in Europe. What makes it challenging in, in Ireland for you guys? 
So they basically, in simple terms, and I think any Irish lawyer would probably disagree, but in very simple terms, um, we have a UK system that didn't go through a lot of the reforms that the UK has gone through. And even the UK system is like de facto not accessible to normal people. Now, if you file a case against the uh, regulator in Ireland, um, usually end up at the high court, um, and that costs you around 100,000 euros in litigation costs. So basically any law firm in Ireland tells you, unless you have 100,000 in cash, we're not even going to talk about litigation here. And most people do not have 100,000 in cash to blow on to a case against um, uh, the, the, the regulator. Um, so it's just the cost of, of litigation, which is largely costs of the law firms. It's not costs of the, um, of the, of the court system. And it, it would go into a whole hour, but basically it's a very analog, very paper-based, complicated complex procedure where you have solicitors and barristers and, and people typing shit up and everything has to be copied and bound in books and, uh, and all that crazy. And, um, and that just overall generates a lot of costs to actually bring a case. Um, and as a normal person, you can simply not afford it. And at least at, under EU law, there should be legal aid. Anybody should have access to legal aid and thereby have the government pay for it if it's too expensive. Turns out in Ireland, there is no legal aid for these types of cases. So you can simply, like, it's an EU law that simply, there is no office to go to in Ireland. Um, so the end result is that and as, as a normal person, you're simply shut out. And and to give you some idea of the the overall cost of the Schrems II litigation, we estimate was around 10 million euros. And loser pays principal. So whoever lost the case would have paid for it. I was actually not even bringing the case. I was a defendant. The DPC brought the case and I was kind of a defendant together with Facebook. And we actually won. So we got, my lawyers got the money paid by the other side. Um, interestingly, Facebook theoretically also won this case, but they've never seeked the legal costs from the Irish DPC. Um, and their legal cost was probably far higher than ours. Well, ours was 1.3 million. Um, now, the DPC's was 2.5 million. We know that from public records. And Facebook's was probably beyond 5 million. So um, overall, we have legal costs of about 10 million. I was a bit surprised that Meta would not have seek that cost from their regulator. And it, they just were quiet about it. So I was like, you know, in Austria, we would call that bribery if you don't get to 5 million from the regulator that you have a right to. Um, that's an interesting. I, I I didn't put two and two together until you just said that. That, but it turns out that Meta was like happy to not reclaim the money from from the DPC, um, and you know, as I as I said, like in Austria, that would probably get you in jail or at least have a serious investigation. But um, a lot of that is not is is not happening in Ireland. Let's put it that way, um, and. And that is the reality that as, an, as a normal person, I mean, it was also by the European side said, okay, look at the citizen, he can just go to court and win against big tech and, and you know, even win against the European Commission in reality, because their tree was torn down <laughs> after all. Um, in reality, it's not that easy. And I think that is why for a lot of the privacy litigation, what works is, is grouping. Like if you have hundreds of thousands of people that are all upset about the same thing, if they all donate 10 euros, you actually have a budget and, and the system to, to be able to bring cases that you wouldn't be able to bring otherwise. So that is also what um, Collective Redress will do in Europe that um, is upcoming. That's also very interesting um, where we can actually, you know, share the, 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 the burden of bringing these cases among more and more shoulders. And that overall allows you to actually bring these cases. But financially, because we talked about before financials, like, you know, doing any of that on our side is, is a total financial disaster, if you think about it. Um, the money is really on the other side usually, um, but you know you you then have to make up in in, in that inefficiency in, in in knowing what you do. That was amazing! What a great episode! Make sure you tune in for the second part of this series with Max Schrems in just a couple of weeks. 